So I'm here uh, just to give you an overview of the involuntary resettlement policy. So as Ron mentioned, there's a full report and policy on this, so if you feel like you're missing some of the content of the presentation, please request the report so you can uh, delve into some of the details. Um, so in respect of the time, I'm going to try and go over this fairly quickly um, so we can get to any, any questions that you might have. Um, just a bit of background on myself, uh, uh, my company, uh, I'm here with Ron as part of Adam Smith International. And Adam Smith International does a lot of institutional building and, and, and capacity building and strengthening. And in this project, they needed resettlement expertise. And, uh, we work with companies around the world, with the World Bank, uh, and, uh, and uh, well, companies in, in, in the extractive industry. And what, what the task was, was to bring that international experience to bear in P&G. Contextualize it, localize it, and make it a made in and P&G approach. So that's what we're hoping to bring forward in this policy. Um, first of all, what are, we really, what are we really dealing with with resettlement? It's really about land acquisition. So any project, as you know, needs land to develop, operate uh, a mine. So the first step in any in any mining pro process is acquiring land. So it's about controlling land and uh, and uh, ensuring that in that process of land acquisition, you're identifying the impacts, the social impacts that arise. So in this case, there's two general types: physical uh, displacement, which is the loss of your house or loss of a home, and economic displacement, which is the loss of uh, your agricultural fields, for example, or whatever you derive your, your livelihood from. So that would be considered an economic displacement. Uh, within P&G, the Constitution allows for compulsory uh, expropriation of land, so in this context, it is involuntary resettlement, meaning the, the person on the land uh, does not have a last resort. A last resort rest of the state. Uh, so we're really just uh, in the in development of the policy taking uh, the results of the stakeholder uh, interviews and results of the scoping trip that we've done to date. We're marrying that with the existing institutional and legal framework in the country and we're applying that through the lens of international best practice. Um, so some of the preliminary conclusions of the engagement is that uh, there's really an issue around identification of social impacts. And resettlement is one of those big social impacts that has not been uh, well managed in the PNG context. Uh, there's definitely a recognized need and support for the formalization of resettlement policies in the country. And uh, there's also, it's been put to us over and over again that the question of role and responsibility <coughs> needs to be resolved. What is the company on the hook for? What is government on the hook for? What are the communities on the hook for that are impacted by a project? Um, international best practice, we're really looking at the IFC performance standards and, and as, that, as that best practice lens that we're, that we're uh, basing the policy on. And within the IFC process, uh, there's sort of five basic steps. And the first one is, is to establish the requirement for resettlement and identify affected people. Identifying affected people is really the key, key piece here, so it, 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 it uh, goes hand in glove with your project area. So defining your project area uh, and, and uh, the land take that will ensue within that project area. Uh, the next is to collaboratively and participatory, in a participatory way, Engage with those affected people and plan your resettlement. Uh, the third is to, uh, with, with affected people, come up with your compensation programs, pay compensation, and then institute the resettlement process. Uh, at the same time, or subsequent to that, you then focus on restoration of livelihoods, and then get into your monitoring and evaluation of your resettlement plan. So that's the IFC sort of way, and that's the, that's the sort of compliant process. Uh, we're linking that process within the, within the PNG uh, legal framework. So looking at what the Constitution requires, what the Environmental Act requires, and uh, other uh, subordinate acts such as the Land Act, the ILG Act, and the Organic Law and Provincial Governance. And all so within all these laws are requirements that for government or component to assist in the 
the resettlement process. If it's the organic law on provincial, on, on provincial governments and local level governments, it is that the provincial government will liaise with landowners in relation to resource development. So there's a role there for provincial government in the engagement process. So we try and clarify those roles within the policy. So the trigger for the policy is land acquisition and identification of physical or economic impacts. Um, the purpose of this is really to guide, guide the, the sector and land acquisition in the, in the mining sector and to lay out uh, the process by which a uh, 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 proponent would do that in mine development. It's really about managing risk and sharing that risk between proponents, government, and communities. And Ron's already discussed a lot about the risk and, and sharing of risk in the sustainable uh, mine development. Uh, the objectives, um, you know, one of the important ones here is, is, again, identifying the roles of government, identifying the roles of proponent and, and communities. Um, some of the key aspects that we're bringing forth in the policy is that complete description of the project, who is affected, who isn't affected by land acquisition. Uh, uh, coming up with a negotiation process or consultation process with stakeholders and laying out the procedures and policies that would be followed within a project. Uh, and the principles follow closely with, with those goals and objectives. So there's a set, of, uh, a set of 10 principles that are in the policies and these guide the policies themselves. Um, Within the policy, there, we have the basic permitting requirements. So what's required at the exploration phase, what's required at the feasibility phase, what's required at the approvals phase, and, and prior to construction. So there's basic, basically a, a, an increasing level of detail as the project moves from feasibility through to uh, uh, prior to construction. And it's laid out in flow diagrams here. Again, this is, a, this is available in the report. And then the type of uh, the condition of licensing uh, requirements for, for each of the development phases. <coughs> so I've already mentioned within the policy itself, it's broken down by components. The first big one is identifying who is impacted. So it's not just about, uh, in this case, landowners. It's, it's about project affected people. So it's identifying all sorts of different categories of users of the land. It could be landowners, it could be settlers, it could be institutions that are using the land or have assets on the land. Um, one of the key things is to understand your, your scope of displacement in designing a project and to evolve your project to minimize that scope of displacement. It's one of the key principles is to avoid, minimize, and mitigate. So um, generally that works well if the proponent develops the resettlement framework in tandem with the EA, because uh, they're going through project designs on the environmental side. That's also good to look at the scope of displacement on the social side. Um, engagement and disclosure is very important. Uh, obviously, part of the sharing of risk is getting communities to understand what it is that's going to happen to them in a, in a resettlement. So what is the impact of the mine on them? What will happen after they're moved? What does compensation mean? What, what can they do with compensation? What gets compensated? These are all the, the issues that need to be discussed with local, with local uh, impacted populations. Uh, typically that's done within a negotiations forum. So it's a representative forum of, of affected people, government and proponent, where you sit around a table and you, and you talk about the impacts and you, and you come to a consensus on how best to resolve those impacts. Uh, that, that content is included in a resettlement action plan, which is disclosed uh, at, at, at its, uh, when, it's, uh, when it's completed. Within that, uh, one of the important pieces within that is disclosure of things like cutoff date, for example, so when the census will happen and what it means after the cutoff date. Um, the, other, the other key component for resettlement is having a a baseline, so what is the current level of or current socioeconomic level of, of affected communities? So you can monitor and track that level as the project is implemented. So that would include things like social mapping, landowner identification, but it, it generally includes all project affected people. 
Uh, we look at both census and asset surveys. Census is really counting the number of people that are within that project area. So if you have a boundary for your mine footprint, you're counting all the people that are residing in that area who are using the land for, for other means. Um, the asset survey then counts all the assets. So it looks at things like buildings, looks at things like crops, economic trees, uh, could be uh, 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 things like uh, resource areas, uh, cultural sites, and, uh, and other assets that are in the area. That data, again, should be stored in a database so it can be, it can be reviewed and monitored. Eligibility is really who is eligible for compensation and what is eligible for compensation. So you're negotiating that in your forum. Entitlements are then what you get as compensation. So if it's a house, what, what, what is it that you get to compensate for the loss of uh, A lot of the focus has been on cash and, and money transactions. So in the policy, the emphasis is on in-kind uh, compensation. What that means is if you lose your house, you get a house as a replacement. What that does is it ensures that, for one, that people who are after resettlement uh, have housing, so they're not spending their, their compensation money for a house and other things and end up homeless or living with family. It uh, ensures their sustainability through the resettlement process. Um, part of the other key features there is the negotiation of unit rates. So, you know, within the law, you just have to. You just have to use value, value or general rates for compensation, but the whole point here is to do market surveys and negoti negotiate with affected people on rates for compensation. Um, in tandem with that, you're also looking at the livelihoods component. So what are people to do after the resettled? If you're taking their lands, how are they going to continue farming? If they're, if they're a small enterprise, how are they going to continue doing their commercial activities? So these. The livelihoods piece needs to be planned out at the same time as the compensation piece. It needs to be ready so that when people lose their house or lose their land, they can enter into that livelihoods program immediately. Um, and those L LRPs are often accompanied by capacity building programs. So we talked a lot about if you get an influx of cash into a household, what do you do with that money? How do you spend it? It's taking you know, in many, in many respects, local communities that don't have a lot of experience with money and transition and helping to build their awareness of what money can do for them, how to utilize it, basically how not to blow it. Resettlement site and physical planning was another big issue within, within the scoping and engagement process. So there are, there's policies around the type of uh, the approach for, for uh, housing design, replacement housing design for location of resettlement sites. So where are people going to be moved to? How do you consult with affected or the host communities in that process? And then what type, what type of infrastructure needs to be constructed within that resettlement site? Is it manageable for local communities? Can it be maintained and operated? What is the funding mechanism to ensure that it can continue? There's a big land management and tenure security approach. Essentially, it just calls just uh, wants assurances that people who are moved have security of tenure after they've been moved. Influx management, again, very important and very prevalent within PNG. and You find this on all the project sites. As soon as a project is announced, people are moving into here. So your, your resettlement plan needs to have a management program for influx. How are you going to deal with influx? How does your, your resettlement site design accommodate influx for your your local township, how does it accommodate influx? So rather than ignoring the problem or putting it off to somebody else, it needs to be a shared problem, again, between government and the mine developer and communities. Speculation management, um, mine developers here are probably aware of the amount of speculation that happens within their mining sites. Again, this is a key thing that relies on the support of affected people to, to implement. So they need to have a good understanding of the rules of, of uh, resettlement. And again, it comes down to eligibility. Who's eligible and who's not? And what defines eligibility? <coughs> Very important are the linkages to, to uh, long-term community development. And this is really a link to the, the long-term sustainable development. 
So within your, within your planning framework, you should be asking the questions of how does the investment in resettlement um, uh, uh, translate into long-term development? So you don't want to have a dependency situation where people are looking for help or assistance from the mine year after year. It should be a program that, that helps people um, uh, get to a point where they can sustain themselves. Uh, so there's really uh, three key things there. The first one is to ensure that people have uh, sustenance when they move from one place to the other. And then you look at enhancing their local capacity, and then you look at plugging them into um, a broader range of economic opportunities. So you should do that in combination through your livelihood programming plus your community development plan. Vulnerable groups and persons, uh, it's very important to ensure that people who are predisposed to vulnerability or, 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 or have further impoverishment prior to being resettled are tracked through the process and that you have, you have programs in place that can assist them maintain their, their, their welfare. Grievances you've already heard about, um, roles and responsibilities, again, there's, there's a, obviously a big role here for government. Um, you know, the Department of Lands and Physical Planning needs to be part of the physical planning process. They need to be approving housing designs. They need to be approving resettlement sites. Social services will have a role in identification and support to vulnerables, et cetera, et cetera. So this is contained within the policy, so um, please have a look at it. Planning and budgeting, the, the resettlement piece itself needs to be costed out at the beginning. And this is a requirement of the, of the uh, MOA that there is, a, there is a budget attached to the, to the conceptual resettlement plan so that money is targeted for that process and, uh, and that the community is aware of that budget as well. So it's all part of the transparency piece for the program. And then m and &E is really you know, linked to the baseline and verifying, tracking, to ensure that your programs are, are doing what they're supposed to do. That's it. So I look forward to any questions you might have.